the session 6 is a hospitality and tourism inclusive human resource management we will be going live now onwards yeah uh, we, we have put the YouTube link in the chat we request the participants if you want to watch the video once again uh, to understand better please subscribe to our YouTube channel which you can access all the videos of the sessions and also you can post your questions I'm sure that probably speaker also will get in touch with you so once again a reminder to everybody a soft reminder try to open your camera during the digital photo session and we have muted mic we have muted mic to all the participants during the session to have a smooth flow of sharing session by the speakers please post your questions only in the slido people who have been joining us from the day one you are already familiarized same code we are using but still i will share the code in the next slide questions posted in zoom chat will not be entertained so please post in the slido because people are using zoom chat to introduce to get some networking and to appreciate the speakers please use your full name uh, by renaming yourself we have given the option to rename yourself because that name will be used for the attendance for every day as well as to prepare the certificates on a daily basis and the certificate will be emailed to all the participants within seven days after we end the summer school the last which is on friday a pool will be released in zoom after the beginning of the interactive q a we got some questions from the both speakers so we will release this pool at the beginning of the interactive q a so people who are new for today's session probably this is the qr code to scan because qr code become very common during the pandemic everybody used to it so scan this keep in your phone all the time so that you can use even for the future sessions and also we ask a word cloud one word feedback we will also post the link in the chat time to time people who have missed to scan the qr code so without further ado let me introduce the moderator for today's session six which is hospitality and tourism inclusive human resource management none other than our colleague from school of hospitality tourism and events of taylor's university dr sri kala kunju raman nair uh, Dr. Sri Kala has been worked in the industry as well as in academic in Malaysia as well as in overseas. She has a very good uh, extensive experience in both segments, industry and academic. And uh, she is also published article related to the topic of today's. And we are happy to have you as a moderator, Dr. Sri Kala. Now I will pass the virtual screen to Dr. Sri Kala. Thank you, Dr. Kandapan. Uh, good day, everyone. Welcome and selamat datang to Preet Summer School, Day 3. These past two days, I'm sure you had immensely learned a lot from various speakers and topics. This session is uh, in relation to inclusive human resource management. When we talked about sustainability, a big component about it is about people, and economy. So, and these parts are also very strongly imbibed in the UN SDGs. So, in current times, with the pandemic chaos, the human capital aspect within tourism and hospitality industry uh, need to be addressed and heard. For that, Today, we have two prominent speakers to share their exp expertise about inclusive human resource management. Let me start to introduce Dr. Tom, uh, Professor Tom Rao from University of Strathclyde, Glasgow. His CV is so impressive. So let me share a few key details. A professor in tourism employment, Dr. Uh, uh, professor Tom had had two doctorates 
in tourism and hospitality in employment policy studies. Hence, it is recognized as a specialist, namely in labor, mobility, and migration. He has worked in 50 countries as researcher, lecturer, and consultant, and also worked with World Bank and a whole lot of this World Bank, ILO, UNICEF, UNWTO, UNDP, EU, and ADP, ADB. He has been a visiting professor to Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, and Malaysia. He's quite popular with Taylor's University. So today he's going to share about sustainable employment amid the COVID pandemic. And with this humble introduction, let's welcome Professor Tom Brown. Professor, over to you. Thank you very much. And I want to um, acknowledge and thank Taylor's University for this kind invitation to, to join what is a really exciting venture, a really exciting initiative to, uh, to create this summer school. And we, we talk a lot about the, um, the, the upsides and the downsides of the pandemic. And there are, clearly there are many more downsides than upsides, but in many respects, the, we are, we're experiencing the upside now. This sort of um, global um, event, this global summer school, really would, be, would not be possible without us having transitioned both practically but also psychologically to different forms of communication. We've talked about remote learning, we've talked about video conferencing and all sorts of things like that for as long as I've been um, um, working professionally. But we've really made, made very little progress until um, 2020. And suddenly, a, a, a bit like, like uh, Jeff Bezos taking off in a rocket um, and, and becoming the second space tourist, um, we've, we've adopted this technology and it's just wonderful to be there. I would much rather be in Kuala Lumpur, I have to say. Um, I miss my regular visits to, to Malaysia where, where I've been um, uh, coming and working for, for over 30 years now. I miss them desperately, but at the same time, this is as, as, as good as we can get in, in, um, in, in, um, in many respects. So let me start my, um, my discussion with you. Um, yeah, I've got the, uh, the, the challenging task in many respects of talking about human resource management in the context of sustainability, inclusiveness, um, and recognizing the changed context which uh, the global pandemic um, has imposed on this particular environment. Um, and in doing so, I'm going to really only touch on the subject. It's such a, uh, a it's such a, 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 a big theme in many respects. There's so many directions we could take it. And I'm really, um, indebted to our second speaker this morning, um, Professor Sridhar Ramachandran, whom I, I know I shouldn't be introducing, but I am in a sense, because I've known Sri for uh, many, many, many years. Um, he was a PhD student in, in my department and we've remained close friends um, uh, ever since. And his insights into a particularly challenging dimension of uh, human resource management in our sector, uh, focusing on the informal sector, complements much of what I'm um, going to say. And therefore, I'm specifically not going to, if you like, develop themes relating to the informal economy, although they are hugely important when we do, um, in terms of this discussion. Um, 
So the theme of um, of the uh, the of the meeting of the conference. Can I just check, uh, Chair? Are my slides moving? Yes, your slides are. They good. are. Yeah, because I, yes. I have technical problems with my slideshow. So you must. Can you make it full screen, Prof? Can you make it full screen, Prof? No, he can't. I can't. Okay. Uh, that's there is a technical issue here, which I'm. It's beyond my competence to to solve. Um, we're talking here about the uh, the 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 17 sustainable development goals. And our discussion today is locates across a number of them. Gender equity, number five, for example, good health and well-being, zero hunger, no poverty. Um, they all have a relationship, a very clear relationship to human resource uh, management. But I suppose the obvious one, which I've highlighted here, is, um, is number eight, is decent work and um, economic growth. And this is really where in, in SDG terms, we are locating our discussion today. So, but when we think about sustainability, when we think about um, this, um, this, this topic, um, and especially, particularly from a business point of view, the focus has, traditionally tended to be on environmental sustainability. Um, in fact, I would argue, and I must apologize to anybody who works in the sort of the green environment field in relation to tourism, I would say that the conversation has largely been hijacked by what I would disparagingly call the tree huggers, people who have a strong natural environmental focus in terms of what they do. Um, and clearly that, that is very important as we're seeing with the climate change debate. But at the same time, there are other conversations going on here in terms of sustainability, and we shouldn't lose sight of them. But we, we've certainly from an industry point of view, um, we perhaps neglect that side of the conversation hugely. Um, You'll all know that sustainability really is built on three pillars, the economic, economic sustainability, environmental sustainability, the green agenda, if you like, and the social um, uh, dimensions of sustainability. And employment work fit very, very clearly, very directly into the social dimension. That, um, and I would argue that that is the, the pillar which most of us um, spend too little time thinking about. We, um, while it's important that we preserve the planet in which we live in order that we can live here, it's also important that we, we think and reflect more on the, the, the breadth of social and, and, and cultural uh, um, impacts and contexts in which um, our industry exists and certainly in which um, employment is located. So when we think of a concept um, very much at the heart of, um, of practical um, sustainability, think of something like um, recycling. We think about um, the physical recycling and the challenges associated with plastics or, um, or other forms of garbage and how we can best um, um, address those. In our thinking, in my thinking around human resource management, I would like us to start asking questions as to whether, whether people are recyclable and whether a, 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 a thinking um, which um, which has not been the traditional at the traditional heart of the tourism and hospitality industry, a thinking which appreciates people as a long term um, um, commitment by tourism businesses. Um, um, whether there is thinking about recycling, the whole word recycling that has that has. Um, value when we think about people, because our industry, sadly, has a history of doing anything but recycling in terms of its human resource uh, management. Uh, and there are good reasons for that. There are structural reasons for that. 
um, uh, our industry in many parts of the world is um, highly seasonal. And one of the real paradoxes, one of the real challenges in, um, in, in tourism worldwide is how you offer people sustainable long-term livelihoods through a tourism and hospitality industry that effectively closes down for substantial parts of the year. And that's certainly true where I come from here in Scotland, our more remote locations on our islands in the north of the country. Um, the tourist season is, is a nine month at most season. And what happens to its human resources when, um, when the industry closes down? And I don't think any of us have really resolved that particular challenge, that particular issue. Um, so if you, if you like, we need to find ways of relating to a workforce in tourism that isn't short term, that isn't transitory, that isn't, um, um, isn't brief and, um, and almost doomed to, to a parting of the ways. Um, we need to develop strategies, thinking, um, a, a way of approaching the management of people, which is much more long term, which is much more um, uh, inclusive. So, again, when we talk about human resource management in, um, in tourism and hospitality, we need to recognise we're talking about a huge diversity of different people. Um, we are talking about people who work for our national airlines, as here, uh, Malaysia Airlines. We're talking about people who work in, in, if you like, at the glamour end of the industry. We're talking about people who work in very tough, very challenging, very difficult uh, working conditions um, uh, in, in hotels, in other businesses. We're talking about a huge diversity of work. We're talking about a huge diversity of businesses in which people work. It's very, very, very difficult to generalize about people um, and work. The sad thing, I guess, is that overall tourism does have a challenging image as an employment sector. If we look at the, the worldwide evidence, um, in many countries, tourism's uh, pay rates are significantly below the average across other areas of, um, of employment. Um, other indicators in terms of things like investment and training, um, in terms of industrial accidents, are negative in terms of hospitality and tourism um, as well. So we do face real challenges, but we, we also face, uh, we also um, have some shining lights. We have some exemplary businesses who, 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 who go against the overall trend and deliver fantastic working experiences. So why can't everybody do that? Why is there this, um, why are there these challenges? Why does the industry face um, high labour turnover, if, for example, in many, uh, in many situations in many countries. So if we're trying to locate sustainability in tourism uh, work, I think in, in tourism and hospitality work, I think we need to go to the roots, um, if you like, almost theoretically. And I know there are um, quite a few students um, joining us here. So understanding some of the, if you like, th theoretical foundations for thinking about this topic is quite important. Clearly, as I said, we are talking about Article 8 um, in the UN's 2030 Agenda for Sustainable um, uh, Development. Full and productive employment and decent work for all. And I think that those words, decent work, is very important. And we'll come back to that because that is, if you like, the mantra of the International Labour Organization, um, but is very, very important. Of course, any of us will then say, well, what do we mean by decent? What is decent for you may not be decent for me. And Decent is a subjective concept, but it does give us some guidance. Sustainable tourism 
again is again at the root of what we're we're talking about tourism that takes account of its current and future social eco so, economic social and environmental impacts addressing the needs of visitors the industry the environment and i've uh, italicized here host communities because that's where the workforce comes from and in a sense we need to think of um, sustainable work inclusive work um, in terms of the communities which, uh, from which the, the workforce come. Now we come to decent work, the ILO, decent work sums up all the aspirations of people in their working lives. It's what people want. Nobody wants tough, dirty, unpleasant work. Um, it involves opportunities for work that is productive and delivers a fair income security in the workplace and social protection for families, better prospects for personal development and social integration, freedom for people to express their concerns, organize and participate in the decisions that affect their lives and equality of opportunity and treatment for all women and men. And that is an incredibly rich description. And I think we, we could spend a long time reflecting on almost every line within that, uh, that, that description. And I think that anybody, any human resource manager in our industry should really have that above their desk when they, um, when, and, and should look at it every day they come into work, as should everybody else involved in the industry. And from that, the final concept, which we'll spend more time looking at this uh, today, is sustainable human resource management, which is an emergent term, uh, a term that's really only come into common use in the last 15 or so years, um, uh, um, and is, I think, something which we've only started to apply in the context of hospitality and tourism. The adoption of human resource management strategies and practices that en enable the achievement of financial, social, and ecological goals with an impact inside and outside of the organization and cru cru crucially here over a long term time horizon it's taking the long view on people and work it's not looking for the quick fix it's not looking for somebody to deliver um, uh, the services or the products that, that that we offer now 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 it's actually recognizing that um, investment development is an, an important philosophy within this whole conversation. Um, so sustainable human resource management then um, covers long term conceptual and practical approaches and activities aimed at socially responsible and economically appropriate human resource management. So it's a balance between the social and the, the, the economic. It's not purely idealistic in a, if you like, a social sense. It recognizes the economic realities um, of running a business in hospitality and tourism. And just as a way of deviation here, just uh, and it's something which I haven't really dwelt on in this presentation, but I think is, is important. Um, we need to ask ourselves questions as to why hospitality and tourism employment and perhaps isn't sustainable at times and I think we need to, to shine much much more of the um, of the spotlight on consumers um, hospitality and tourism along with other products and services in modern society have become too much the focus um, from a consumer point of view of cheap 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 let's get the cheapest flight we can to go to Kinabalu or to Bangkok or whatever, without thinking of what the consequences of that are. If we were willing to pay more for our, for our food, for our to, to our tour guides or whatever, um, perhaps they would benefit more, perhaps their communities would, would benefit more. But this obsession with cheap, which in this country here in the UK, we're obsessed with, where we really are in terms of, of tourism products, the whole advertising campaigns of the global booking um, companies etc is is undercut undercut get get a cheaper price for your hotel room or whatever it is and i think psychologically consumers need to take responsibility 
for some of the challenges we face in human resource management in our area. Okay, coming back on agenda then. Sustainable human resource management can be used for organizational planning and change situations. It's a very good philosophical starting point for the whole process of change. Sustainable human resource management can, can help in sustaining employee dignity in times of retrenchment and other difficulties. Um, and, and, and we've seen the reverse of that in many cases during the global um, pandemic over the last few months. Sustainable human resource practices are arguably a win-win for employers and employees, creating a reciprocal sense of loyalty and engagement in both, uh, both parties. It's a coming together which benefits both, uh, both sides of the coin, if you like. Sustainable human resources management is inclusive and creates opportunity for all sections of society. And I think that's again, very, very important. So we can look at a number of different conceptual approaches. What I think is quite useful in Esfahani's model here is that it recognizes the wider context of human resource management. It recognizes that there is a, that there are all sorts of things that influence the situation, the, the experience of the individual at, at work. There are cultures, attitudes, values. There are strategies and objectives from a business point of view. Um, there are, there's also recognition that all of us exist beyond work. We have other lives which are very important and which many employers don't really recognize. And I think that's, that's, that, that is an issue. And then there are instruments, methods, processes, structures that we can put in place, uh, whether it's our recruitment policies, whether it's our um, human resource development policies, which support uh, these ideas. And likewise, um, Mazur uh, recognized that there are psychological, sociological, strategic, and if you like, uh, corporate social responsibility dimensions to uh, sustainable human resource management. So there's a lot going on here and it's, it's complex in that sense. Um, so sustainable human resource management generally focuses on the rights and responsibilities of the, of the individual in the workplace, putting in place practices that get the best out of employees over time, treats them with dignity, and the whole issue of dignity in work is another theme alongside decent work, which I think is very important here, um, and encourages them to stay, but to go further, not just to stay in the same job year in, year out, but to develop as a human being, to develop in the workplace. Um, Ina Ernet, who's perhaps one of the, 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 the leading gurus in this area, talked about developing mutually beneficial and regenerative relationships between internal and external resource providers, employees, their families, very important education system, the natural environment, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that is very, uh, th th those, those concepts are important here. So uh, the, the um, CIPD, the UK credit, uh, professional body for human resource management, identified a range of the key components um, within a sustainable HR, um, long-term orientation, workforce planning, assessing the needs of future employees, care of employees, health, safety, well-being, work-life balance, or life-work balance, which is a term I prefer, because I think it gives priority to life over work which I think all of us should really take aboard. Care of the environment, fostering eco-careers, rewarding against environmentally sustainable um, uh, behavior, profitability, share programs, for example, um, uh, employee, share, employee share programs, employee participation and social dialogue, employee development, job rotation, training, employability, um, external partnerships, building the, the network, if you like, flexibility, uh, flexibility both from the employer point of view and from the employee point of view. Recipro reciprocity is the key word here. Compliance beyond labour regulation. It's not only about complying with what the law says, 
it's doing the right thing for people with people um, encouraging fostering employee cooperation um, teamwork for example which we pride ourselves on in hospitality and tourism but we don't always uh, deliver and fairness equality and equality fostering diversity respectful relationships fairness as regards remuneration um, and and career opportunities recognizing the value of diversity in every one of its dimensions as a real strength unlike some cultural theorists such as Gerd Hofstede who see diversity as a challenge um, diversity is something to celebrate and of course Malaysia is 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 is, is the, the perfect example of a, of a of a diverse community and it's something really I, I genuinely believe in a work context that we should always be celebrating um, in practice, this, this has, um, this means recruitment and selection with a clear eyes, eye to the future, training to support the needs of both the business and the individual, recognition of wider life, design of safe and supportive workshops, close working relationships with external stakeholders, um, and promotion of, as I said, of diversity as an asset. Um, but there's plenty going on in our industry that is not sustainable. Work that you can't call, you really couldn't um, call decent. Perceptions that it's a low skills industry. We can debate that one. Low productivity compared with other sectors. One of the challenges is that it's the, their perception is that anybody can do the work. We can all, we can all. Uh, we can all cook we can all clean rooms we can all do do the work that goes on in tourism uncompetitive in pay terms challenging work conditions we work when others have fun and that's that that is an issue high labor turnover although that's not necessarily always a problem and a poor diversity record we're not in, in, uh, inclusive in creating opportunity for all and there's good evidence that there's a lot of dis discrimination going on and if we just look at gender indicators as one area in terms of inclusive exclusivity we're an industry which we're, in which where women make up 55 to 60 percent of the, the global workforce and seven, nearly 70 percent in some regions um but if you look at the, the statistics, women hold less than 40% of all managerial positions, less than 20% of general management roles, less than five uh, than 10% of board positions. And crucially in the current context, women have been disproportionately disadvantaged by the impact of COVID. Women have been the first people to be let go across the globe in terms of um, uh, of support and because many women work part-time in the industry they haven't necessarily benefited from the the social support systems which some governments have put in place and we can look at similar evidence um, to uh, in terms of other marginalized disadvantaged groups minorities whether uh, based on ethnicity faith migrant status people with disabilities etc at best we we this is a an excluding and unsustainable waste of talent and worst it's blind discrimination um so i mean the questions come from this we wrote a paper i wrote a paper with a vietnamese colleague um a couple of years ago um looking at um human hu sustainable human uh, or employment policies in tourism as a human right and linking it to some of the human rights thinking i think that's important because human right um, i think as a human right we have a, a right to decent work and the ilo i think would agree with me in this respect um what's been happening just coming towards the end here what's been happening in relation to covid19 I think we've seen many steps back as, um, in terms of sustainable human resource management in hospitality and tourism as a consequence of the pandemic. It's clearly the pandemic has devastated businesses and employment opportunities in our sector. And depending on what estimates you believe, upwards of 150 million people worldwide have lost their jobs in the sector. Many will not return, either because they've found alternatives or because the opportunities won't 
won't be there for them into the future. We've seen stop-start um, uh, activity in, in, uh, in many countries, certainly in this country, the, the industry is opened, it's closed, it's opened, it's closed. And that's a challenge to businesses, but it's a challenge to people who are looking for sustainable work, who are looking to, to feed their families. Um, as I said earlier, the vulnerable have been most affected. Women, youth, students, disabled, minorities, migrant workers, informal economy workers. COVID-19 has exposed the intersection, an intersection of disadvantage and, in, and exclusion in, in tourism and hospitality, which, is, uh, which will take a long, long, long time to heal. Um, we've seen accelerated technology substitution, particularly in the global north taking people out of tourism work, an automated industry. Who wants to go into uh, a luxury five-star hotel and not meet any people? Um, when I come to Malaysia, I want to meet Malaysians. I don't want to meet uh, Japanese technology or Chinese technology or American technology. Um, and, but I think the whole sense of uncertainty, we talk about getting the confidence back of, um, um, of, of, of travelers, of tourists. We need to talk about getting the confidence back of the workforce because it's been hugely damaged. Um, and if, you, if, if I was a parent with a, young, with a young child going into the workforce at this stage, um, I would need some persuading to encourage them to go into our industry, industry at the moment, to be honest. Um, is there a future? I don't know. And these are the sort of issues which I've, I've been lucky enough and to work on and to think about um, a lot in, um, in, in the recent past. This is just a blog I published through our own business school, um, looking at what the new normal in terms of work is going to be. And that, was, that just came out this week. Um, we also wrote a paper last year looking at the impact of, of the pandemic on the, on the hospitality workforce and questioned whether um, this was a, 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 in terms of, of, of precarious work, in terms of the work that was going on, whether this really was a, a new situation or just an amplification of the norm. And we actually concluded that every, virtually everything that was happening had been happening before, but just had been raised, was raised to a new level as a consequence of the, of the um, uh, of the pandemic. So I want to leave you on a, on a rather more optimistic note. I want to leave you with, uh, with if you like, the um, something which is based on my, I suppose my whole, uh, um, my, my values in terms of uh, a vision for decent, inclusive and sustainable work in tourism. Um, and in looking at where the industry should be by 2050 and something else I wrote a couple of years ago, um, I envisaged a world in which tourism and its value chains, and it's important to remember that our industry has very complex and diverse value chains upon which it de uh, depends, whether in agriculture, in manufacturing, in transportation, um, in IT, that tourism and its value chains meet the highest ethical standards with respect to work and employment in all of its sectors and levels within, within the industry, respecting the rights and dignity of each individual worker and offering them opportunity to gain just reward for their efforts and to grow and progress irrespective of gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, age or disability. And that, that's, if you like, a, um, a commitment, a, a belief which underpins the notion of sustainability in relation to human resource management in um, hospitality and tourism. It requires a leap of faith. It requires uh, a belief in the future and in the belief, if you like, in the, uh, the integrity and the value um, of the individual, which perhaps going back to my notion of of people as garbage in need of recycling, our industry isn't always the best at delivering. So I think there's a huge challenge for hospitality and tourism here, um, whether it can deliver on it, uh, um, um, given all the other challenges it faces is a big, big ask. But I think if it doesn't, 
the industry will um, will continue to struggle in, in employment in um, in uh, terms in attracting the best people into its fold. So I want to conclude there and just say thank you. Uh, thank you for listening to me. Apologies again for my technological um, limitations in, in delivering this. And I look forward to, um, to learning more about um, um, uh, your thoughts through, through the question process, through the through interaction and i've put my email address there if, if if you if any of you want to continue this conversation offline i'd be very happy to do so thank you very much thank you thank you so much uh, professor for that thought provoking and very profound information uh, in fact, uh, I used one of your papers when you're sharing your papers and like seeing I used one of your papers about two weeks ago for a paper of mine. So that is very interesting to know that the author is here and sharing his um, profound knowledge about this whole thing. Okay, there I'm sure there are a lot of questions coming up. Uh, we will wait for that after the second speaker. So now let me uh, introduce the second speaker. Uh, uh, our second speaker is an uh, equally impressive speaker, Professor Sridhar Ramachandran from University Putra, Malaysia. Uh, Professor Ramachandran specialized, uh, specializes in, in uh, sustainability, especially in the areas of responsibility tourism and tourism marketing. Uh, he has contributed widely uh, in uh, researches, in publication, and international conferences uh, related to leadership uh, in sustainability, tourism marketing, collaborative management in responsible tourism, and corporate social responsibility. He's also, he, he also has a professional certification as an action learning coach, conferred by the World Institute of Action Learning. Uh, Professor Ramachandran is going to share about informal economy and um, informal economy so, uh, in the tourism uh, sector. With great pride, I'd like to uh, invite Professor uh, Sridhar to share his presentation. Thank you. Professor, to you. Okay. Can you see the screen? Yes, we can. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Srikala, for the introduction. And uh, I would like to congratulate and thank uh, uh, Taylor's University as well, uh, Prof Nitya, Dr. Mustafa, Dr. Kanzapan, Dr. Shantini and the team to have uh, put together this wonderful uh, event. Uh, congrats again. And um, my topic today uh, will be on informal tourism economy. I was supposed to talk about something else, but uh, I was given this topic. Uh, so uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, for allowing me uh, to come into the human resource space, uh, though I am pretty much a novice as, uh, compared to your, your uh, years in uh, HR. Uh, but I, I did became um, very interested in the informal tourism economy when the pandemic started. See, uh, I was invited by the Economic Planning Unit uh, of Malaysia uh, to share some of the uh, our thoughts uh, from an academic perspective. And, and one of the things um, that really was of concern because MCO, move, Movement Control Order, means uh, you can't move. And for tourism to take place, you need to move. So that's the first one to hit. And when that happened, um, people knew, uh, I mean, those who are registered under the ministry, so we could assist in some way. Uh, from an economic perspective, but 
the big chunk, the big chunk of the, the industry or the sector were the micro enterprises, as well as the unregistered uh, uh, practitioners, if you, if, if you would want to see. So these are the people uh, who we didn't know. And that's when we started asking this question. Do we have the data set? Have we done uh, much study with regards to the informal tourism economy? Because uh, they, in a way, uh, are dependent on their income on a daily basis. If tourism doesn't happen for a day or two, then uh, they might not have food on their table. So uh, there could be situations of such, because uh, I, I can draw upon some of the experiences uh, that uh, from my own research, especially uh, in Sabah. See, we picked Sabah some time back uh, because Sabah is one of the uh, poorer uh, state. And then within Sabah, we chose a, a location called Sampurna. Uh, it's one of the beautiful dive sites, but as a district within Sabah, it is among the poorer uh, district, I would say. So uh, I will explore the context of what informal uh, tourism economy is uh, from a broader perspective to Malaysia, then I will come on to the Malaysian context. So um, if we were to ask what makes, okay, what makes the policy makers and researchers interested in the informal economy? So if you look at, uh, and in relation to SDG, the first point I would like to say is that more than 60% of the global workforce aged 15 and over is employed in the informal economy. This is 2018, so uh, it could be higher, it could be lower, but I think we were hit by pandemic, so I have not been able to get the more recent uh, uh, stats on that. The other thing that we are looking at is uh, to fill the product and services gap in the formal tourism sector. At times, when you go to a particular destination, especially a rural destination, say if you go to an established destination like Taman Negara, then you may get a certified a nature guide a, with, with a green badge. But if you go to a lesser known uh, uh, park or a lesser known uh, forest, uh, you will know local people with local knowledge, but they might not have the certification, but they are highly dependent uh, to take tourists or recreationists uh, for a hike, but then uh, they, are, they are not registered or they are, uh, they are not listed anywhere. So there is a vulnerability, there is risk uh, with regards to people who are not able to participate in the uh, formal sector. Then the biggest uh, part of the informal uh, tourism economy is that it is directly, I think as uh, Tom mentioned as well, directly related to SDG 8. Informal tourism entrepreneurs, they create jobs. Uh, you can be a, a resort owner, for example, in Sampurna, uh, but when you have many boats, okay, uh, you, you are able to give job to the boatman. Okay, so that is creating job. Or even indirect, even if, uh, if, if it is an indi indirect impact, uh, if your boat uh, is faulty, you need to repair it. So because of tourism, uh, even jobs not directly related to tourism are created. So when there are impacts within the uh, tourism context, uh, or when there's no uh, formalization of all this, uh, there is, there, we, we are at risk and we are not able to detect people to assist, especially uh, in times like this where, where there are either health-related shocks or even economic shocks. Then the next uh, component that we would like to look at is uh, income, income for the poor. So this directly uh, addresses SDG 1. So uh, very often than not, uh, tourism assists, okay, there is a pro-poor tourism, tourism assists to elevate poverty. And uh, this can be seen in uh, many places uh, where um, even like if if, you, if if we if we have visited Sampurna, agro tourism context, uh, they do uh, grow seaweed, for example. Uh, 
uh, besides uh, besides uh, diving or snorkeling, you do have the agro-tourism context. And uh, if we do not provide a sufficient, uh, I mean, if there's no flow of tourists going there to that place, so that will directly impact uh, on their income. And uh, finally, uh, if we look into the livelihood part of it, if we talk about informal economy, uh, it relates to the livelihood, to socially disadvantaged as well. Uh, many groups are there when we mentioned about marginalized community or socially disadvantaged, and uh, they include the women, uh, migrants, ethnic minorities, and uh, to some extent, even the natives, uh, Orang Asli. So uh, we are also touching on SDG 5 and SDG 10 here uh, with regards to livelihoods and disadvantages. So this makes uh, informal economy exciting and interesting for policymakers as well as researchers to, to uh, explore further on how uh, in, in, in some countries they're even looking into how to formalize without uh, creating fear or threat to this uh, informal uh, actors. So uh, what consists of the informal tourism economy? So if you look into uh, the definition or uh, uh, I, I'm looking into this Slocum, Beckman and Robinson's uh, reference, all the market activities of agents and business engaging with the tourism industry, whether it is direct or indirect, but they are not registered with any form of authorities, formal association or trade organization. So this was one of the major problem we had uh, during the economic planning unit uh, meetings where we wanted to come up with a recovery plan, but we did not know how to source for the informal economy because most of it, uh, are, if it's registered under the Ministry of Tourism, then uh, they are uh, medium and uh, larger uh, sectors, but the micro enterprises are the ones uh, which is huge, but we were not able to uh, uh, pinpoint it. Now, uh, if we look into the informal ec economy, there are many actors eh, uh, within the framework. So, Jitney Cap, I, I've not, uh, this quite quite some time since I came across this term. Uh, in Malay, it's known as Kreta Sapu. So it's a taxi, uh, it's a cab, but without license. So, uh, and, and this is very common in, in, in uh, rural places, uh, like uh, if it is a tourist destination. And that's the reason why if you see uh, on the right-hand side corner, Sampurna is the place that we did our study. And I think you will see so many of these uh, uh, transport providers who are without a proper license or registration. Okay. Then we have the street vendors. Uh, since we did our study in the coastal or island uh, environment, so you could see that the, there are boat vendors. So you have these uh, boats uh, where the native people there, as could be the Suluk, uh, Bajau, the Bajau Lao, uh, they come from resort to resort. Uh, selling uh, crabs, fish, uh, or, or any any uh, yield from the ocean. So this is another way of their survival. And then we have unofficial tour guides, as I mentioned earlier. Some are registered, some are not. Okay. And of course, we have food stalls. Uh, and uh, I think when uh, those who have been in Malaysia and uh, are in Malaysia. Uh, we are we are somehow foodies somehow foodies so uh, food stall is something uh, that uh, easily uh, can 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 prosper uh, at the height of a tourism uh, business okay and then we do have uh, artists whether it is musician uh, it's a, a dance performance so all these are also related but uh, some of them, especially if it's a basking kind of a group, uh, they are not registered. And same goes to uh, those uh, informal uh, players who, who work on handicrafts. Uh, uh, like I think uh, the Mahmiri community, if Dr. Puwa is here, his, his study was on that. So uh, we have also uh, issues uh, in, in, in identifying them. And of course, 
uh, official homestays are there registered under Tourism Malaysia. But if you look at uh, the list of homestays that will come out in the uh, internet, you will see most of them have not been uh, registered under the Ministry of Tourism. So again, these are challenges when it comes to informal economy. And uh, as much as I would also like to touch uh, on gig or digital economy here, if you look at the left hand side, you have Airbnb, Grab, uh, Uber, uh, Goka, Couchsurfing, uh, Love Home Swap, uh, many of these digital platforms because of gig digital economy, um, they don't they don't really fall under the mainstream uh, economy because for some reason uh, this is this was, this was another question that we had uh, during the pandemic. How are we going to monitor Airbnb because it's not it is not being regulated by the Ministry of Tourism. If there are any cases uh, where you have uh, uh, if it is COVID positive and it was through an Airbnb outlet, how would we then uh, monitor when it's not regulated? So these are some of uh, potential concerns. Uh, as much as I think this could be very interesting, the gig digital economy could be of, uh, of interest to many youths, uh, millennials and post millennials, but uh, there are certain risk factors when uh, these are not regulated. So uh, that's on the uh, actor's part. Now, I would also like to look at this informal economy. That is from a broad context. I'd like to look at it from the Malaysian context. Okay. So if we look at, uh, look at it from a Malaysian context, uh, the enterprise is not registered. So the criteria for, for a, a entity, an agency, or a business to fall under informal uh, economy uh, it should be an enterprise that's not registered with the Companies Commission or any other professional bodies, including the local authority. And at least one of the goods or services produced are meant for sale or butter. Uh, employees should be 10 or less, and it involves a non-agricultural activity. So this is how uh, in the Malaysian context it has been uh, defined. And also the informal sector refers to economic activities of workers and entities which are in law or practice not covered by formal arrangements. So they may not be covered by SOXO, for example, they may not be covered by EPF. So, so these are the things that will uh, not provide them the safety net uh, in the event of uh, economic crisis or, or health crisis. So uh, like uh, the, the picture on the right, uh, Kia, okay? Uh, selling uh, uh, banana fritters. So no business license, no coverage of EPF SOXO, uh, and involved in this kind of uh, small food stall, hawker base. So this is, this is the, uh, the context of how informal sector in Malaysia is uh, perceived uh, or, or defined. And uh, moving on to the informal employment in the informal sector, if we look at the labor force, it's close to 15 million. Uh, employed is about 14.48. Uh, and then we have uh, agricultural, non-agricultural. If we focus on non-agriculture, the informal sector within the non-agriculture uh, contributes to 1.36 million, of which 62% is services. So I am pretty sure uh, a big chunk of this uh, will be involved in the tourism sector, though we do not have the exact break breakdown except for point number two, uh, accommodation and food uh, beverage services activity. So that, that itself is 25% of the uh, major percentage of the informal sector. And uh, it is interesting to look into the demography of it because um, who, who are the ones who are really involved? If demography from an education angle, if you look at the education perspective, um, the blue color on the left, okay, the, the bar chart, SPM means O levels, uh, O levels and below. So those are the ones who are the majority, okay, in the informal sector. Uh, those with a degree are fairly small. Uh, without certificate is also small. But uh, the trend is such that uh, towards 2017, uh, the percentage of degrees have increased possibly because of the digital economy. Uh, 
uh, as well as there are also programs uh, in the universities where uh, they are um, uh, motivated or encouraged to go into entrepreneurial uh, activities. So that's one. On the right hand side, if we see 64.7% of in informal employment had secondary education. So what happens then? Because a lot of school leavers uh, after all levels, they go straight into this informal economy. So are there, is there a safety net in terms of their human capital development? Okay, uh, in terms of the uh, economic uh, safety. So all these are questions that uh, comes to mind uh, when we speak about informal economy. And uh, Malaysia as a whole, uh, there are 10.6% from the employment in non-agriculture sector when we speak about informal employability. And uh, surprisingly, if you look into the statistics, Selangor, Selangor has quite uh, the high, uh, higher population of this informal sector. Um, again, possibly because uh, one third of the country's population is in the Klang Valley. So based on that, uh, the, the percentage could be high. Also due to a recent increase in the gig economy, so that percentage could be high as well. But otherwise, you could see Sabah and Sarawak on the uh, East Malaysia, uh, where the percentage is uh, fairly uh, high as well. Uh, where they, uh, and Sabah especially, uh, is very, very, very rich with uh, natural resources and tourism resources. So uh, it's a big concern uh, when uh, we do not have the right statistics to understand or the right database to understand the informal economy, especially uh, during a crisis uh, what the, like what we are facing now. So um, now, impact of COVID to the informal sector. 70% of informal employment in the informal sector comprise of self-employed. Okay, so many people are self-employed, so even worse. So there's, there's no, no way for us to know uh, where they are or, or uh, what they have registered into. Based on the labor force survey for the first quarter of 2020, uh, 2.6 million people <coughs> work as self-employed. 17.4% uh, of, of the workforce. Then unpaid family worker accounted to 0 0.62 million. And it was also estimated that almost half of self-employed empl employees have lost their jobs. <coughs> and 0.62 million unpaid family workers. Okay, So these are the kind of impacts uh, that we have seen during the uh, pandemic and the uh, when movement control uh, order took place. So based on the uh, economic uh, studies report, macroeconomics impact, on a worst case scenario, when we look into informal economy, 1.46 million job losses. Best case scenario, close to 1 million out of 16 million employed. So uh, we are looking into various aspects here, especially when it comes to vulnerability, Women's Aid Organization in 2020 commented that the stimulus package was not widened to the vulnerable group. <clears throat> and this vulnerable group are the most at risk due to MCO. So this wage subsidy policy uh, target workers in informal employment has ignored substantial segments of individuals in vulnerable employment, including the self-employed informal workers unpaid family workers and disproportionate, or who are disproportionately women. So we can see uh, <coughs> the marginalization uh, of the uh, informal sector here. I'm quickly showing this because uh, to give you an uh, idea of the size of the uh, SMEs, uh, because when we talk about tourism, uh, there's a big chunk that falls as uh, enterprises or, or whether small, medium, or micro enterprises. And if you look at the numbers here uh, on the left hand side, 600, more than 600,000 SMEs are micro enterprises, <coughs> of which 20.6% are women. And, uh, and the sector that is involved in will be the service sector, which tourism is part of. Okay. So uh, it gives a, a broad idea of involvement of these micro enterprises, uh, which may or may not 
have a record which may or may not uh, be regulated, which may or may not uh, be registered uh, in some way or another. So uh, moving towards inclusive HRM, um, I, I, I thought for the Malaysian context, I'll look into three uh, policy documents. The extreme left uh, is on the national entrepreneurship policy because uh, when we talk about informal economy, uh, there are a lot of uh, micro enterprises that falls under this category. And right in the middle uh, is the national tourism policy. That's from 2020 to 2050, the uh, economic policies up to 2030. And very recently, we also came up with the Malaysia digital economy blueprint. <coughs> the digital blueprint has become more important, especially uh, when there's movement control order. So how do we uh, leverage on this? Uh, how do we ensure that this can uh, make sure that there's inclusivity uh, when we speak about uh, the tourism sector, okay? So, so these are the three documents that uh, I'm going to um, uh, look into to see where we are heading to in terms of uh, inclusive human resource management within the tourism context. So the first uh, policy is national entrepreneurship policy. If you look into the right-hand side corner, uh, blue stands for inclusiveness, uh, the yellow is for sustainability, and the red uh, is equity, eh? equitable growth. So we can see that there are components of SDGs in there, and uh, the, 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 in the heart of it is for shared prosperity. So in terms of policy, uh, it's well-crafted, uh, opening up, so if you look at the first point, opening up business opportunities for entrepreneurship to all segments eh, of Malaysian society to ensure e inclusive economic transformation, okay, so that the social economic status is elevated. And then the second is uh, B40 uh, for those who are not within the Malaysian context or, or who are not familiar with the Malaysian policy. Uh, these are, we have below 40. Uh, then mid 40 and then the top 20. This, this shows the uh, income uh, component uh, within or, or the economic status uh, of, the, uh, of, of the nation. So uh, the whole idea of this entrepreneurship uh, policy is to also uh, focus on the B40 so that their household income is uh, elevated. Okay, So for the rural communities as well as community-based cooperatives. And then the third point emphasizes on the capacity and capabilities of these cooperatives, these business uh, units, so that uh, wider access to programs, assistance, and business opportunities are given at par with SMEs. And uh, we also have uh, targeted assistance. Okay, so this is good because uh, the marginalized community as well as uh, the communities that are not normally focused at are uh, also uh, being given uh, priority. So targeted assistance and intervention programs to boost entrepreneurial capability and skills of Bumiputra, the disadvantaged groups, uh, these are the marginalized groups, special focus group including women, youth, senior citizen and uh, orang asli, the natives. So this is uh, the overall picture of how the national entrepreneurship policy can uh, in a way assist in the inclusive um, uh, human resource sustainable uh, development within the context of tourism in Malaysia. Now, let's look into the tourism policy itself. <clears throat> we look into point five and point six, but before that, if we look into the definition of the strategic direction, there are interesting words there, <coughs> which is relevant to the topic today. Transform Malaysia's tourism industry by harnessing public-private sector partnership, embracing digitalization to drive innovation and competitiveness towards inclusive, they've used the word inclusive development in line with UN's uh, SDGs. So uh, I think in terms of policy, uh, tourism policy, we are very much in alignment uh, with the SDG. And uh, I picked a few uh, points, especially in uh, Point five and point six, uh, upskill human capital as well as practice sustainable and responsible tourism. And some key points there is applying inclusive development. Again, uh, 
the policy emphasizes on applying inclusive development to include women, youth, and the disadvantaged groups. So if you see both policies, the first policy and the second policy have an emphasis on uh, the marginalized. So monitoring the tourism industry's contribution to the UN SDG, not only they have the policy, the po there's also a policy to ensure that monitoring of SDG happens. Then uh, training of the local artisans at craft villages to conduct demonstration workshop classes, because uh, many of these local knowledges could die off if uh, such activities are not uh, done. Select a pool of local champions, because uh, we do have some very capable uh, local entrepreneurs, uh, and then provide them with the necessary business skills training, internship placement, uh, whether domestically or abroad. Also improve the quality of edu tourism education and the credibility of the profession. I think uh, uh, Tom also mentioned earlier it is in his uh, presentation, where looking to look at tourism as a profession that is uh, respectable. Okay? Then enticing the youths, okay? uh, this is another area with fresh ideas and new skills set into the tourism profession. And finally, set up smart tourism incubators involving institutions of higher learning, uh, digital tech, as well as SMEs and local communities. So these are some, some of the uh, policies that directly uh, channels towards uh, the establishment or development of uh, inclusive and sustainable uh, human resource uh, tourism policy. And finally, looking into the digital blueprint. Eh? <clears throat> uh, if you look into the right hand side uh, section of this slide, the word inclusivity is there. Okay, so when we talk about inclusivity, again, we are talking about digital inclusion. So if you look at the first point here, vulnerable vulnerable groups are provided with opportunities to become digital entrepreneurs in uplifting their socioeconomic status so in policy very clearly stated very clearly articulated more targeted policies towards achieving a digitally inclusive society to make sure that you know uh, even the especially the informal economy so that they don't shy away uh, from uh, tech improve digital literacy and skills among society members as well as workforce equipped with specific skills in digital economy that allows them to grow in tandem with the nation's digital economy. So, so uh, we can see that these three policies, there are many, uh, but these three policies at this point in time uh, appears to uh, somehow uh, put us on the path uh, where we can achieve uh, inclusive human resource uh, sustainable development eh, from a tourism angle. So my next question is, what potential policies can address vulnerabilities and shocks of the rural economy? I think we'll go back to this quality and equality of education. Uh, if we look into uh, Mabul, Sampurna again, uh, there are people with documents, eh, uh, birth documents, uh, country documents to show citizenship. And they are people because it's bordering uh, Philippines and Indonesia. So they are children, young children without documentation. They don't have access to education. They don't have. Uh, so when you don't have access to education, uh, there are very, very sad scenes uh, with, with, with children standing outside the school learning. You know, these, these children are without document, but they have to stand outside the classroom because they do not have the documents. So uh, it's, it's, it's a very sad situation. So these are the things uh, which we have to subscribe to the, uh, uh, either, whether through UN, uh, HCR or, you know, uh, so, but it's something that we need to look into as an educational reform. Then supportive social system, uh, inclusive of progressive and simple. A very uh, high tax. I think there must be some progressive way of uh, of of managing uh, to slowly rope them in. So that once the informal becomes a bit more formalized, then uh, we can reduce the vulnerabilities and also enhance financial inclusion. Uh, there are projects and programs like uh, uh, microfinance, uh, but 
do people know the existence, uh, how accessible they are? Uh, are they given training? Uh, are they provided, again, a quality education uh, with the financial assistance? So these are areas where we need to look into and uh, eliminate uh, excessive regulations and bureaucracy. I think uh, keep it simple, uh, keep it straightforward. Uh, if, if you ask the in, uh, people in the informal economy to go up and down uh, the government agency and office for 10 times, perhaps they will, they will not be excited or motivated enough. So uh, besides the earlier SDGs, we have also, from here, we have also covered a few more. Uh, for example, uh, quality education and uh, equality among uh, 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 citizens as well as non-citizens, okay? So, so these are the areas that uh, we can uh, potentially look into uh, to address the vulnerability and shocks of the informal economy. <clears throat> Finally, okay? Uh, uh, I want look at the right hand side. This is this may not be um, a complex policy cycle. Eh? Uh, how policy is designed, developed, as well as uh, implemented. But I think it's good enough for for today's discussion. The three policies we saw, okay, they are really beautiful. And in terms of the agenda, in terms of the policy formulation, it's fantastic. The concern now, uh, even based on our studies, we had, uh, we had the opportunity to study rural uh, tourism uh, context uh, for, for at least five years uh, from 2012 to 2017. Okay? And one of the major things that we saw was the challenge in policy adoption and policy implementation. Simply because the country has a three-tier governance. Uh, three-tier governance means we have the federal government, state government, and local government. And on top of that, when we have Sabah and Sarawak, uh, east of Malaysia, uh, we have uh, their own uh, prerogative uh, because they have this uh, Malaysian Agreement 63. So they have even more autonomy compared to the other states in Peninsula Malaysia. So when you have the three-tier governance, uh, the policy happens at a federal level. Now, when it goes down, trickles down to state, would this, to what extent will the state adopt? And to what extent will the state implement? And from the state, when it goes to the local government, what extent will it be adopted and implemented? So this is where uh, my concerns are uh, after looking into many destinations, especially the rural destinations. So that's why I put here, these are the potential showstoppers, eh? the three-tier governance uh, and, and how, how they coordinate uh, the implementation of the policy and the adaptation of the policy is a concern. Also working in silo, uh, for example, eh? uh, let's say if I'm, I think Tom mentioned this, the moment you say sustainable or responsible, uh, you look into tree huggers. So similarly, when we say responsible tourism, the Ministry of uh, Natural Resources and Ministry of Tourism should work together. Uh, they shouldn't be saying that, oh, uh, this is because there's an element of tourism, Ministry of Tourism takes over, or because there's responsibility or sustainability, Ministry of uh, Environment should or Natural Resource should take over. So the working in silo mindset also needs to change. And I think the other thing is lack of speed in developing uh, competencies. So when we talk about uh, lack of speed in developing, uh, lack of and speed in developing competencies, um, when you talk about informal economy, for example, microfinance, there's an agency called um, Takun. As, uh, okay, so, so when they want to give money, are they sure when they are giving the financial aid, how sure are they that uh, there, is a, there, there is enough training, there is enough uh, competency for them to be successful in the business. Okay, so these are the things that uh, have to be uh, thought of. And the final part, I am using these two German terms, Universität and Ausbildung, uh, simply uh, because <clears throat> in the German system, whether you go through the academic route or the skills-based route, uh, you are not looked down, okay? But 
in the Malaysian context, again, the mindset should change. Eh? It shouldn't be uh, those who failed in SPM. It shouldn't be those uh, who are school leavers. It shouldn't be those who go to vocational school uh, who, are, who end up in tourism. We should have a more open, uh, this is where the education system, the reform of the education system should take place. The, 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 the child or the student can be brilliant, uh, who has the potential to be a medical doctor, but if his interest, if his or her interest is to take the skill set route, uh, the school system should not uh, stop them. They should nurture them. Uh, I, I, can, I can say it because I went through the school system. My children are also in the school system. Uh, sometimes nurturing doesn't happen. Okay. Uh, sometimes uh, it's even worse. They feel tortured. Right. So uh, this is based on experience. So uh, we need to look into how the learning takes place, where the learning is something that is uh, of joy to the learner, as well as that learning process uh, builds about bring, builds about, uh, uh, about growth in the tourism sector. So this is something that we need to look into as well. So uh, food for thought, tourism and hospitality ultimately will have to ride the waves of digital and entrepreneurial disruption to achieve inclusivity and sustainability. So thank you very much, Terima kasih for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Sridhar. Um, very enlightening to know about this informal uh, employment and informal economy and what's happening in the tourism industry, especially under the Malaysian context. Um, right now, we time is limited, so we're going to go into the Q&A. Okay, very fast. Uh, we go into Q&A. I just want to prompt you, the polls are going to come up. And so just be prepared by the, uh, when the polls come up. Uh, I just want to ask you a question. This is general. I think Prof. Uh, Tom plus uh, I mean Prof. Sridhar also can address quite a few of them have come up with this uh, question. Uh, human resource management is a long-term activity. Uh, and uh, right now with the pandemic, uh, with the COVID pandemic happening, um, you find a lot of turbulence happening, employment, unemployment is happening. Um, it's what is the uh, what is the way we can uh, uh, bring about? Uh, how do we solve this? Or how do we handle this? Because we're all talking about unemployment. Um, anyone? Uh, how do we uh, address this issue? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll come in this come in first on this one um it's a it's a hugely important question um and unfortunately there isn't a simple formula or answer that we can give to that um i think we're all um feeling in the dark to try to to work out what the, the post-pandemic future might hold uh, hold i think we're seeing some of the consequences already in in a number of countries in the UK and Australia and elsewhere, where um, as the industry starts to open up again, which ours is here in the UK, um, it's also facing significant labour shortages. I mean, just at an anecdotal level, uh, some of the cafes in the village I live in can't reopen because they cannot get cooks and cannot get chefs. So, um, I think it's not a case of only how can the industry uh, uh, find its or retain its workforce in, in the current conditions. It's, it's an imperative that it does. It has to, it has to find um, people and has to support people um, as, um, as a means of survival. Interestingly, there's also evidence, particularly from the US and elsewhere, that the workforce are getting more militant, that the tourism workforce are getting more militant and are demanding better conditions. And there's, there are a number of, um, of examples where workers, employees have walked out on tourism and hospitality businesses demanding better conditions. And I think that's, that activism, that agency, is going to be something we're going to see a lot more of. The industry is going to have to be um, cannot take its workforce uh, for, uh, for granted, but it will take a long time um, 
for the industry to recover and for the workforce to get back the confidence um, to participate in the way it might have done in the, in the past. We are talking about a very, very different world going forward. And I think we're all going to learn rather than necessarily have answers. Thank you. Prof, uh, Sridhar, do you have anything to add on? Uh, just a quick one. Um, it's very interesting that uh, that question came about. And as uh, Tom mentioned, uh, it's a very complex situation. Uh, in fact, um, one of the first questions that, that I asked uh, when the EPU during the economic planning unit session is that we have gone through epidemic in the past, like SARS. Uh, do we have a database from, the, from that crisis. What is our crisis management plan within the tourism context? Is that, does the ministry, does the government have uh, established system? So uh, it was quite vague. I, I couldn't get uh, a, a straightforward direct answer. And uh, I think what we can do now is we can capitalize on uh, our technology. I think, I think data analytics, uh, we, we need to have, because um, it's huge, it's complex. Uh, if, if we were to pull together um, our, our own thinking cap, it might take long. But from whatever we have learned, if we can uh, come up with some sort of a simulation where there is a, 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 a AI is used or some sort of data analytics, uh, decision analysis is used, uh, that will be useful in future uh when it comes to a quick response a quick uh, response and recovery uh, uh what they call uh pathway um uh, in relation to your technology question a lot of you a few of them have also asked would there be a lot of changes technology wise in terms of uh uh, artificial intelligence in terms of robots and, and all this digitalization happening, would people be still be unemployed in this post-COVID era, post-COVID era? Because you talk uh, about technology, I, I know, I know Tom, talking technology. Uh, yes, yeah. I, I know Tom likes authenticity. He, he might not want a robot to serve him uh, his coffee or, or water or wine or whatever, but... Uh, I think when we talk about technology, we are not taking away authenticity. We are creating new jobs, okay? Uh, there are jobs that uh, we do not know, that is unknown of, uh, or, or that, that uh, we can't uh, digest yet that to be seen as, as, as a job, you know? Uh, that technology, because there, you, you need a lot of coding work to be done. You need a lot of uh, uh, background uh, work done. Uh, uh, to see the robotics of it, I've seen some some hotels where I think I'm not sure if Japan or China they have robots uh, serving uh, uh, water as well as uh, towels to each rooms and all that. So so that's fine, but I think it will not take away uh, the job, but it will evolve into new jobs. I, th I mean, I think I think I, I agree. Um, but I also uh, with 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 Sridhar here, but I also throw in um, some work, uh, words of caution as well, because, um, yes, I agree that technology has the capacity to create uh, new types of jobs, which will require different skill sets. Now, the paradox here really is um, I talked about decent work and undoubtedly technology has the capacity to to reduce the need for work which is quite honestly not decent if, if you like in terms of human dignity and there's a lot of that um, in tourism um, at present um, but at the same time the paradox is that for many countries particularly in the global south some of the poorest countries in the world um, if you take away labor intensive jobs, if you take away uh, the lower skills jobs, what are you offering communities? What are you offering youth? Now, the, the, power, the, the dilemma is, should we really be asking people to do these sort of jobs? So it comes down to the question of, is, is any job better than no job? Um, but if we replace our, um, 
our night markets, our food markets, for example, with a series of vending machines, um, what will that what will that leave? And you might say, no, that won't happen. But if we if we do automate a lot of what's happening, um, we're going to lose the skill set. We're going to lose the traditional, authentic. You used that word, Srida. Um, uh, authentic <laughs> uh, skills, and we're going to end up with a street of vending machines. Um, and certainly, that I wouldn't want to visit uh, a food market on that basis. So that it's inc the, the paradoxes come staring, come right out into your face in relation to this. I don't know, to be honest. Okay. Good, thank you. Actually, there's lots of other questions, but we have no time. So we're just going to go through this polling effect here. Uh, you can see the, the results here. Um, can seasonal work in hospitality, tourism uh, have, uh, ever sustainable and inclusive? Yes, uh, 73 of them said yes. Uh, SDG 8 talks about decent work. Uh, actually, there's a lot of question about this decent work, but we can't ask you. Uh, can hospitality and tourism really offer decent work to all? Yes, um, good. 74 of them said yes. 74 of them said yes. And SDG are merely lip service. Ah, is it all talk and no action? True, a lot of my 69% of them said uh, no, it's not. And, and only 31% uh, said yes, uh, it's, it's part of lip service. Huh? Interesting. So this is the end, uh, oh, there's, more, there's more here. Uh, Post-millennials prefer the informal economy, yes. Okay, they are, um, a lot of them are, um, don't want to continue their studies and they are going into informal uh, economy. Uh, government and develop, developing uh, government of developing nations are serious about sustainability and inclusivity. Yes, 67% of them said yes. Thank you so much for the poll. Thank you so much for your answers. Now it's time for, um, for me to do a summary here. Um, actually, this, um, uh, it was a very, very, very enriching and, uh, and enter, uh, uh, enlightening uh, topic. Actually, we need more time for this. There's lots to share because it deals with us. Okay, if you're from, coming from the hospitality school, uh, this is also equally a very important topic for us. Um, it's good. Um, uh, Prof. Tom talked a lot about uh, decent work and economy growth, and and um, and and there's a there's a lot of link with SDGs. Uh, and you're moving away, it's very good. Uh, all the time the focus have been with environment, now we're moving away into the social pillar, plus the cultural impact uh, of people, uh, how we deal with people. Uh, we, uh, we all, uh, Prof. Tom also shared uh, about appreciating the diverse people within the, uh, the tourism industry. And as you know, that um, the human resource sustainable, uh, human resource management faces a lot of challenges, uh, especially with high employee turnover. Not anymore now, I think people are looking for jobs, but yeah, one time it was high turnover, um, plus decent work, okay? A lot of them are not paid well, um, discriminations are happening. Uh, and and uh, work conditions may not be the uh, 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 very good compared to uh, other industries. Huh? And of course, there are a lot of opportunities too. There are a lot of opportunities where there's flexible work happening, life work-life balance are happening, and uh, employee share programs are happening. Um, you can see he shared his uh, two of his researchers too. I'm sure there are many more, but these are areas for us to explore later, okay? So for us, when we are finished uh, with this, uh, um, this summer school, it's time to go and explore all the different papers uh, Prof. Tom have uh, shared, uh, shared about the conceptual framework of F S Hamis, uh, Mazur, and of course, he shared about, um, uh, in the case of COVID, how uh, 150, pe 150 million people have uh, sort of uh, lost jobs and, and, and there's a lot of changes 
uh, in terms of employment. Uh, another summary in terms with uh, Professor Sridhar, uh, you find that 60% of the global workforce are in the informal economy. I mean, we hear about it, we, we hear about uh, informal economy, but when it comes to figures, then it's when we really see there is a lot of people out there affected uh, because of this COVID, affected because of uh, the pandemic, where they are working on, on, on informal uh, jobs related to tourism, they're not registered with any tourism board and they're sustaining all by themselves. And, and uh, they're all self-employed. And, and, and it's interesting to know that uh, a good number of youth have also, who finished high school, but never bothered to uh, continue their studies, but uh, went and ventured into informal uh, tourism or informal economy related to tourism. So he also shared a lot with the Malaysian government and PE uh, stand and all the details and the statistics with NPE's details. Thank you so much. Uh, it's really, really, um, really good. Like I said, we need more time. A lot of questions were asked. We needed more time to share, but time is a limit today. Uh, we got another session later. So thank you so much. We're going to do, I pass it to Dr. Kandapan. To uh, thank continue. you. Thank you, Dr. Srikala for moderating this session very well. Thanks to the speakers. So due to the time, uh, we request all the participants to open your cameras to do the one word, word cloud feedback. So you can scan the QR code so that please post one word of your takeaway or feedback, which we will share the outcome of the word cloud after the digital photo. So the link also will be shared in the chat now. Let's move on to the next one. I request Mr. Gopi to do the digital photo session. Dr. Mr. Gopi, please turn on your cameras, participants. Ladies and gentlemen, participants, please uh, give me your best smile. Okay. On your mark. I won't say cheese. Okay. I say let's go. One, two, three. Let's go. Your best smile. Okay. Just a moment. Uh, the next group. Uh, Okay, again, your best smile, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, go. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Gopi. Let's see Brilliant. the word cloud results. So we got almost 60 people. Uh, I think, yeah, informative, the bigger bubbles showing the positive outcome of this particular session. Thanks to both the speakers, Prof. Tom and Prof. Sridhar. I think the in inclusive, informative, sustainable, interesting economical growth. I think it's keep on popping up. I think uh, so many positive words has been rolling around in the Slido. Thanks to the participants for taking your time to give the feedback and always being support you. Okay, please keep posting. Probably we will take the final word cloud after maybe five minutes. We will uh, try to capture that. So let me go to the last slide of today's session. So once again, on behalf of the CRIT, Taylor's University, Malaysia, we would like to thank the speakers, both the speakers, uh, Prof. Tom and Prof. Sridhar and the moderator uh, Dr. Sri and Mr. Gopi for running this session effectively and trying to manage the time uh, very well, even though there is a slight delay of 10 minutes, but we managed to cover. And thank you, participants. Please take a quick health break to join the next session in another 15 minutes to 20 minutes. 15 minutes, we will start playing some videos and uh, exactly in 20 minutes, we will start the session, which is technology in hospitality and tourism industry. I think even the current session, there are a lot of discussion on technology. If you want more answers for the technology in hospitality and tourism, please don't forget to come back and join us in 20 minutes. The session number seven, which is by Dr. Alicia Ali and Dr. Aaron joining us with two moderators. Okay, now I thank once again everybody.
go and take a quick health break take some coffees refresh yourself and come back in 20 minutes thank you so much thank we will you, start prof. in 20 minutes thank, thank you, you dr Sri. thank you prof um, thank you thank you bye 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 thank you prof sridhar and prof tam